We are agreed. The next item of business is topical questions. And we start with question number one from Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what minimum price it recommends setting for a unit of alcohol. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Taking account of a range of factors, including the responses to the public consultation, the Scottish Government concludes that a minimum unit pricing of 50 pence per unit provides a proportionate response to tackling alcohol misuse, as it strikes a reasonable balance between public health and social benefits and intervention in the market. Scottish Ministers will now proceed to propose to the Scottish Parliament that a minimum price of 50 pence per unit is introduced from 1 May this year. The Scottish Government commissioned the University of Sheffield to model the impacts of a minimum unit price policy. A range of minimum unit prices was modelled, showing the level of reductions in alcohol-related harms. The Scottish Government decided that a 50 pence minimum unit price resulted in a level that is proportionate. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It is now broadly accepted that minimum unit pricing is a huge piece of the jigsaw in terms of changing consumption behaviours, but alcohol is also linked to seven different types of cancer, including breast and bowel cancer. And given that public awareness on this issue is relatively low, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the Government has any plans to implement a public health education campaign highlighting the risks of alcohol, which could sit alongside the implementation of this legislation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I thank uh, Jenny Gilruth for her uh, question? Um, I mean, first of all, she's right to highlight the uh, the harm reduction that this policy uh, will achieve. And uh, over the, the five years of this policy, we expect to see 392 fewer alcohol-related deaths and over 8,000 fewer alcohol-related hospital admissions. Uh, Jenny Gilruth is also right to... Uh, talk about the impact on, for example, cancer rates, and we know the links to, to breast cancer that alcohol uh, use has, has been linked with uh, over the, the last uh, few years has been uh, very strong evidence indeed. Uh, in terms of the public health uh, campaign, uh, absolutely the public health campaigns that we run generally are linking the, the harms associated with alcohol misuse uh, to uh, public health uh, messages and making sure we get that across. Also, uh, there will be an awareness campaign uh, that will go along with minimum unit pricing to both raise awareness amongst retailers and the public about this policy introduction to make sure everybody is aware of the details of this policy being introduced and that uh, the materials for that are, are going out very soon. Jenny Gilruth. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary advise if the rates set for minimum unit pricing will be kept under review and if, if any po broader policy review, as is permitted by the legislation sunset clause, will be carried out by public health experts and not by the involvement of those in the alcohol industry? Cabinet Secretary. So, as I said in my initial answer, we believe a minimum price of 50 pence uh, per unit strikes a, a reasonable balance between public health benefits and intervention in the market. Uh, we are uh, committed to evaluating and monitoring the impact of minimum unit pricing on individuals, on communities, on the alcohol industry and on Scotland as a whole. Um, NHS Health Scotland will lead on this and work is well underway on establishing and commissioning the various studies involved in the evaluation programme. And as Jenny Ruth mentioned, we inserted a, a sunset clause into the legislation and this requires the Scottish Government to report to the Parliament on the impact of minimum minimum unit pricing no later than five years after it begins. The report will then be debated here in Parliament and a full vote will be required in order to continue the policy. Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And could the Cabinet Secretary please give more details re regarding both the timescale in terms of the Scottish Government intending to begin evaluating the effectiveness of the 50p per unit minimum and what mechanism potentially the Government would bring forward to look to increase this rate in the future? Cabinet Secretary. So the evaluation will be ongoing, so we won't wait to the end of the, the five years and for it to be evaluated. It will be an ongoing evaluation uh, that uh, will be uh, taken forward, and I think that's uh, quite right uh, and proper. In terms of keeping the, uh, the, the rate uh, under review, of course we'll keep the rate under review to ensure it delivers the desired outcomes for the people of Scotland, but we believe that the, the 50 pence rate is the right rate uh, 
um, and there's no current plans to change that because, well, for two reasons. One, uh, all the modelling has been done on the 50 pence per unit and the, therefore, in terms of the evaluation of what we think will be the harm reduction, we would want to measure that against the modelling that's been done by the University of Sheffield. Secondly, obviously, the consultation that we've just carried out, a majority of respondents um, supported the, the 50 pence minimum unit price rate uh, being retained. We don't want any further delay on this. We want to get on with the, the policy introduction and set, uh, sticking with the 50 pence per unit price is, is, the, um, is the right way uh, to proceed and uh, we hope we'll have the support of Parliament in doing so. And ask Sarah. So I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree that minimum unit pricing on its own will not be a silver bullet to fix the harmful relationship many have with alcohol. And we must also look at the deep-rooted causes of that relationship, the relationship between inequality, poverty and in health. Um, as it stands, the implementation of MUP it would give a windfall to supermarkets in terms of their profits. Uh, and we believe that money should be clawed back to actually invest back into public health. Uh, will the Minister consider uh, how we use our tax powers uh, that we now have in Scotland so we can introduce uh, such a levy that would mean extra money going to public services and to local people? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, um, we are using our tax powers to deliver an additional £400 million into uh, the health service um, in this next uh, coming year. And, the, of course, £20 million of that has also been earmarked for alcohol uh, and drug uh, services. Uh, we've invested uh, over £689 million in tackling drug and alcohol problems since uh, 2008. So there are already substantial resources going in uh, to alcohol and drug services. In terms of the, any revenues raised, and it's important to say that would not be profit, it would be revenues raised. We don't know who will benefit uh, from that, whether it's a retailer, the wholesaler, producer, or a combination. Plus, I think we have to uh, set that against the, the likelihood of a reduction in the amount of alcohol, particularly for some products. If you take chemical cider, for example, it is a substantial increase in the price for chemical cider. And I think that will result, and I hope, I'm hopeful that will result in an impact on the sales of that product. So I think we, that's why it's important to do the evaluation to properly understand all of that. And of course, we'll keep those matters under review, but let's get the, the policy up and running, and then we can evaluate that aspect of it as well. And Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a Borders MSP, does the Cabinet Secretary foresee booze cruises down the Tweed to Berwick being an issue, <laughs> or white van man woman down the A1 endeavouring to thwart the legislation? Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> uh, it's unlikely, in our opinion, that the preferred price of 50 pence per unit would make it worth people's while to travel, uh, as, of course, it would cost them in terms of fuel and time. Um, and we think a 50 pence per unit uh, price sets the right balance to avoid uh, the scenario that Christine Graham is painting. We acknowledge that the way we buy alcohol has evolved in recent years with online sales and telephone sales providing new channels for alcohol purchase. Obviously, minimum unit pricing will apply where alcohol is dispatched from within Scotland. Obviously, it won't apply if it dispatches from England, and you know that's obviously a, one of the limitations. But we, we will consider what we can do better to better understand the issues around online sales and telephone sales and the refresh of our framework. And we'll closely monitor the impacts of minimum unit pricing once the policy is in place, including uh, cross-border sales and online sales. And I should have also just said in relation to uh, a point that, uh, that Anna Sauer asked, that it's important, whether it's that issue or cross-border issues, that there are 40 measures in the alcohol framework which has been refreshed. Uh, this is one. It's an important one, but it's not the only measure uh, that we are taking to tackle alcohol misuse. It's part of a package uh, of which I, I uh, think will help us to change the relationship we have with alcohol within our country. Question number two, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government for how long peak trains between Edinburgh and Glasgow will operate with reduced carriages. Minister Hamza Youssef. Now, first of all, can I say that, of course, I regret any reduction uh, in capacity in any of our services uh, in Scotland, let alone uh, our key arterial route between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Uh, the interim changes 
to peak time capacity are due, as the member probably knows, to slippage in the introduction of the new Class 385 fleet and contract, uh, contracts ending to lease four trains or 12 carriages. Uh, ScotRail has made significant efforts to try to reduce the impact of this as they work with the manufacturer Hitachi to introduce the new 385 fleet as quickly as possible. Uh, Hitachi, the train manufacturer and ScotRail are working, of course, tirelessly towards introducing the new trains, uh, some of which are undergoing testing. However, it's important to say at this stage that neither ScotRail nor Hitachi nor, of course, I would be comfortable at all uh, with compromising uh, safety and we simply will not do that. So we must listen to drivers' concerns around windscreens. Uh, we are in close contact with ScotRail to ensure the impact of these short-term capacity problems are minimised. Passengers, passengers are being given help to plan their journeys, including clear information on services with more capacity as well uh, as reduced fare on the Edinburgh to Glasgow route via Airdrie. Uh, ScotRail has already altered leases for diesel trains to help mitigate against project delays and every attempt has been made across other rail operators and leasing companies to either prolong leases or indeed secure additional trains as a short-term solution. Um, I have here the Minister's statement at a meeting of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on the 29th of March last year. That's 11 months ago when he told members that, and I quote, the introduction of the first new, longer, faster and greener Class 385 trains remains on schedule for the autumn with the full fleet becoming operational on the Edinburgh to Glasgow route during December. The minister was pictured everywhere claiming credit for all of that. Now, is the minister aware that these delays to the rollout and the consequent reduction of carriages will have a major impact of the lives of thousands of commuters? And it wasn't just about the drivers with the windscreen. This has been delayed a long time before this became public. Minister. Uh, can I say to the member, of course, uh, I absolutely regret the inconvenience that's been caused uh, to passengers. Uh, what I am saying here is that clearly there's been issues, and these have been well documented, of course, uh, around the manufacture of the trains. Now, there are other issues the member is alike, right to, to allude to them, but he, is, he would be, be remiss of me not to point out the fact that productivity at the new UK plant, uh, issues around supply chain with Hitachi, a global company, have been the primary factors in the delay that we're seeing. But frankly, I don't think passengers care really who's to blame. They want to see the new trains into introduction. And that is what I'm working to do. But I cannot compromise safety. There are some train sets built. He probably uh, knows that a number uh, built, uh, a number uh, going through testing here in Scotland. But until the drivers, until ASLEF, uh, who are right, of course, absolutely correct to, to, to put forward their concerns, until they are satisfied uh, that those safety issues uh, uh, have been resolved, then I won't be putting additional, uh, well, I certainly will be putting additional pressure on Hitachi ScotRail, but not to compromise uh, safety. So uh, while he is absolutely right to raise concerns that passengers have, I don't dismiss that in the slightest. Uh, what my job is to try to do is mitigate that as best as possible. And we have done that. ScotRail have managed to extend some leases uh, and have managed to, to change around their schedule and maintenance and refurbishment so that the impact is not as bad uh, as we first feared. Uh, but clearly, of course, the sooner we resolve this problem uh, and this issue, uh, the better for everybody involved. My grumbles. Well, with carriages on peak services reduced by up to 50%, commuters face the unenviable choice of getting on a train packed to the rafters to an even greater extent than normal or going the long way around. They've had to put up with a lot in recent years with the promise of faster trains and more seats, but this latest day buckle wasn't part of the plan. So perhaps the minister can tell the chamber if he has set a deadline for this problem to be resolved and what the repercussions will be if Abelio Scott Rail, if the rollout of the new carriages is not delivered in any time frame that he sets down. Minister. Uh, you know, he tried to push me on this, I know, in, in, in the, the Rural Affairs, uh, Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. And the reason why I didn't give them an exact date is because clearly I have to give Hitachi uh, and ScotRail the room and the time to work with ASLEF, the drivers, to come to a satisfactory conclusion on the windscreen and also some of the other issues uh, that they are facing. But I can promise him that the pressure I'm putting on them uh, is extensive uh, and uh, is great. Uh, what I would say is, from May onwards, I think the members are also aware that we have the delivery of the high-speed trains as well. Now, with, with the introduction of the high-speed speed trains, uh, that should mitigate uh, uh, some of the capacity issues uh, that we face. But he's also right to say in his, his, his question to me that uh, with the introductions of the 385s, once these issues are resolved, with the AHSTs coming uh, into service as well, there will be an enormous amount of uh, additional capacity which passengers will feel. And in the meantime, in, help, in order to help 
uh, mitigate some of the capacity issues we're facing in the short term. Uh, the, there is, of course, the Airdrie to Bathgate route, which, uh, of course, uh, is longer, but uh, £13 all day during peak times as well should hopefully help to minimise some of those overcrowding issues. I've got five members still want to ask questions, which is impossible before the next debate, but if all the members just ask a question, no preamble, and the Minister gives us the sixth answer, we'll, we'll try to get some of them in. Uh, John Mason. Uh, I wonder if the Minister can say how many people are using the Airdrie Bathgate line, if he knows there's any extras? Minister. I'll try to get him the information and send that across. Jamie Green. Oh, sir, I'll, I'll keep this brief. Uh, when was the Transport Minister aware there would be a problem with contracts and rolling stock coming to an end before the delivery of new carriages? Is he aware of any further leases that are coming to an end, given that there are no available rolling stock carriages anywhere in the country? And if he thinks the situation is representative of a rail service which excels in its forward planning and ability to deliver a reliable, comfortable service for commuters? Minister. Uh, can I just get to the last point of his question before I answer some of the other points that he made? And it's worth saying that, of course, it would be expected Hitachi, the train manufacturer, to deliver these trains uh, last autumn. And in fairness to ScotRail, they built in five additional months, almost six months, of additional uh, time at the end of the lease. It would, you would have to have some heck of some crystal ball to envisage some of the problems that Hitachi have been facing as a global company, I have to say, I'm astounded at some of the problems they've been facing uh, in terms of supply chain and, and, and in terms of productivity at their new plant. So it's not a lack of forward plan. There was a number of months built in at the end of the leases, uh, and they've done their best, Scott Rail, to extend some of those leases, but clearly in, in the case of four trains and in the case of four, 12 carriages, they've not been able uh, to do so. Uh, yes, of course, we, we are aware, uh, and we have a, a spreadsheet, and, and we, have, we know when trains are going off lease. Scott Rail know when they're going off lease and are currently and continuing to, to, to plan for the best case scenario in terms of the introduction of 385s, but also prudently what would be the worst case scenario and how we'd mitigate against uh, some of that. In terms of uh, when I knew uh, about these, uh, I understand the criticism that's coming from opposition members. I hope they'll know that I've always been the first to come to Parliament and indeed right to the committee uh, whenever I've known about these issues uh, because it's better, of course, to be upfront about these matters and try to find a, a solution to them. And I promise him that I'll continue to keep Parliament and the committee, relevant committee up to date. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Given the, the recent BBC documentary, Mind the Gap, revealed instances of passengers collapsing on a ever increasingly overcrowded trains, and given the concerns of unions such as the TSSA over cuts in staffing by ScotRail, leaving stations without a health and safety department, what recent discussions has the Minister had with ScotRail specifically over the issue of health and safety? And can he give a categoric guarantee that passengers' health or safety has not and will not be reduced as a result of the delay in the delivery of new trains or as a result of staff redundancies? Well, I think the member raises a really important point. I mean, health and safety in our transport network is my number one priority. I'm dealing with, of course, where other challenges we'll be facing in the next couple of days, and that is absolutely paramount in everything uh, that I do. Uh, rather than take my word for it, it's probably worth going to the independent regulator, the operator uh, of road and rail, the ORR, uh, who, of course, uh, deem whether or not trains are safe. And, and, of course, our trains are absolutely deemed to be safe. But that's not to take away the, the point that Colin Smith rightly raises around staffing. I met with the unions, uh, the, 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 those that are involved in the railways, uh, during my quarterly meeting with, with them uh, only last week. And they continued to push me to push ScotRail uh, around issues around staffing. And I'm pleased to say uh, there, is, uh, there is more recruitment happening uh, on Scot ScotRail, which should help uh, with some of the concerns that the members raises. But in terms of our trains being safe, uh, absolutely, uh, that is our number one priority. And that is, of course, as you know, is the well-documented reason uh, well, one of the reasons, I should say, uh, for the delay of the introduction, uh, rightly, uh, has left, of course, mentioning some of the concerns, raising some of the concerns they have around the windscreens. Apologies to Mr Finney and Mr McKee. I'm afraid we have no more time. We've already eaten into the next debate. So that concludes topical questions. Um, I'm conscious that we did drop speakers and cut back time in the next debate. And the next item of business is a debate on motion 10652 in the name of Aileen Campbell on developing a Scottish healthy weight strategy. Could I invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now?